Investors Chronicle. Hello and welcome to the Investors Chronicles Companies and Markets show. I'm Alex Newman, an associate editor at the magazine, filling in for Mark Robinson, who was meant to be filling in for Dan Jones, but who in, is instead, and as I speak, having one of his teeth filled in by a dentist. Today, I'm joined over the line by Deputy Companies Editor Julian Hoffman, who's going to be walking us through HSBC's latest results and what they tell us about China. Uh, in the studio, I have Deputy News Editor Michael Fay to discuss this week's cover feature on the pitfalls of large-scale infrastructure projects, as well as Deputy Ideas Editor Gemma Slingo, who covered what was arguably the Halloween scare story of the week in ASOS. Thanks all for being here. There's not been a ton of company news or results to wade through this week, though some of the largest blue chips have been reporting quarterly figures. One of those blue chips is HSBC, the third largest company listed in London, which serves as an opportunity to discuss a huge geopolitical story that, unlike the current crisis in the Middle East, has a much more definitive capacity to affect markets and corporate earnings, and which has understandably gone under the radar of late. And that story is China. Let, let's start with headlines, if we can, Julian. What did HSBC report in its third quarter figures this week? Yeah, the, the third quarter figures were pretty good. So they reported net income of about $7.7 billion, which was slightly under what uh, the market had been expecting. But uh, everybody's bank earnings are slightly under what the market had been, had been expecting this quarter. So there's no great shakes there. You know, they're expecting about $35 billion of net income uh, for the year. So they look on target at least to uh, achieve... Uh, the year figures. It was a notable set of results, really, because nobody asked the chief executive whether he's going to be splitting up the bank. Um, and the main reason for that was that uh, alongside those figures, uh, HSBC dropped a massive share buyback in the quarter of $3 billion, uh, which brings the total for the year so far to seven, but it's obviously the, sing- the single biggest quarterly total that they've put in place. Uh, and that obviously reflects the fact that some of their margins have been uh, improving on the, uh, around interest rates, uh, but also I think it's a it's a kind of an attempt perhaps to improve the mood music uh, around the bank and its results that till quite recently had been dominated by this uh, this breakup question and also the underperformance of the Chinese uh, property market, which uh, is making itself felt in uh, in a wave of uh, ever increasing impairments when you when you dig into the figures. <laughs> So yes, it was a, a kind of canny uh, tactical move by uh, by the Mr. Quinn, Noel Quinn, the, the CEO, and um, yes, yeah, so the, the market generally was took it well, if not you know with a huge amount of enthusiasm. But when you can contrast the fact that uh, NatWest the other day at one point dropped eighteen percent, yeah, um, it was it was a, a respectable performance. So yeah, nobody can nobody can really uh, argue the argue the toss with uh, HSBC on, on how it's doing. It's just that whether its its core markets uh, are, are, are going to be healthy enough for it to thrive and grow in the in the years to come, or whether it's just going to be a source of uh, of uh, impairments and losses. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and that kind of relates to, you know, the topic that we want, you know, we're moving on to. Really, yeah. Isn't it? It's uh, this news earlier this week, uh, which sort of got buried by, as you said, by uh, um, geopolitical events in other areas that uh, China is flooding its money markets with liquidity in a bid, it, it seems, to turn around the economy, which had been sort of descending into a kind of uh, funk, really, hadn't it? A kind of a bit of a trough. Yes, yeah, so that, that, those headlines kind of got buried, but um, the numbers are, are reasonably significant. And it's uh, you know, something like $100 billion that they're pouring into the money markets. Um, and it's, 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 it's a sign that, the government obviously feels nervous about the way the economy is going, um, but there are have been in recent weeks other stats that have come out that have shown a certain recovery in in some areas of the economy. So things like services have been improving apparently, and uh, even sort of factory output has reached a, a kind of a floor. Um, obviously, property, which is such a huge part of, of the Chinese economy, is not going anywhere at all. Uh, but uh, you know the market kind of expects that. But it's the liquidity boost which is helping valuations of shares, particularly. Yeah. Um, and the hanging saying over the last five days 
is up uh, a few percent uh, and uh, it's definitely it's made investors take notice of that fact yeah. really so i mean just quite a lot to unpack there i mean just the one thing that that noel quinn did comment on was the state of the property crisis in china his line was that he thinks the worst is behind us or we are at the bottom you know it's not necessarily a definitive call about things improving but w- w- what was the evidence that was uh cited there for uh is it this this huge stimulus that's coming in from the state which is 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 giving uh it is giving lenders like hsbc a bit more security well there is talk uh i was I was watching the, the the headlines earlier today and i know that china daily is probably not the the most reliable of uh of, of sources but there is uh talk that um the government is moving to restructure quite a lot of debt particularly um, in the local government area, the ones that are you know, the most exposed to property debt, to property development debt. Uh, and that might help put a floor under valuations if that's, uh, I mean, certainly that's the take that that uh, some analysts are looking at. Whether that happens in practice is, is a difficult one to call. Uh, you, the problem that you, you tend to find in China is that um, you, you get one set of figures, but uh, they have another book of figures which they actually use for the decision making. So if they are generally going to restructure all this debt, then uh, you should see that in uh, bond valuations. And there hasn't been any real movement in in, in property bond valuations. So he's probably, you know, he's, 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 he's perfectly within his, his uh, right to say that there could be a, a bottoming out. But uh, I, I think that he's hedged it quite quite right. subtly really yeah but <laughs> looking at it i mean it's just there's just so much stuff that comes out that's very contradictory so you know there's a couple of the bigger developers that are, are still in technical default on another set of coupons uh evergrande is the one that everyone writes about but uh country garden as well and um there's no sign on what the resolution of that is yet yeah. so uh until until i have my, my view is that until that's that's uh that's clarified then you, it's too early to say that that's bottoming out. But that doesn't mean that other sectors of the economy aren't aren't, aren't benefiting because there may be a sense that uh, people are spending a bit more money, which is what's helping services. At the sure. And definitely the liquidity coming in at this rate will will definitely move the needle somewhere. Yeah, and I mean HSBC itself, in some ways, a contradiction of a of a company, but it, it models through uh, regardless. I mean, the China has has long been the you know the differentiator, particularly when you're you know comparing it to NatWest or Lloyd's or you know the other uh, big UK listed banks. But uh, you know, of course, HSBC is not all about Greater China and Hong Kong. There is uh, you know they have divisions elsewhere, not least the UK. Was there much sort of points of interest in in the results there about how their business is faring um, outside of Asia? So the the, the ex Asia business. So the, the only thing that came up that that was different particularly was that they might not be selling the french bit of hsbc so everything else was more or less predicted as to be in line um the the impact of not selling out in france means that they reverse quite a lot of possible impairments which will flow through to the bottom line when we get to the the full year but i mean operationally it wasn't it wasn't out of the ordinary you know margins are up in their key markets like in the uk but that trend is now starting to reverse uh, they're just as exposed to people taking deposits out and then putting them into term accounts uh, as anyone else in the UK market. I don't think there's any difference there. And in fact, I think that was a big trend in Asia as well, that uh, their key uh, customers were were looking for higher rates of interest. What I struggle with, always have struggled with them, is that they doesn't seem, they, they kind of sold their, their business model on the fact that they're in one very, very fast growing part of the world. But in fact, it looks like the, the two halves of the business actually mimic each other in in many fundamental ways, particularly when it comes to you know keeping margins, and uh, that suggests to me that the the business they have in Asia is already maturing very quickly, um, and starting to mirror what you see in Europe and the, and uh, North America, and 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 that sort of undercuts the case in many ways uh, for breaking up the bank. So I mean, if it's not um, if there's no real difference in what they're doing, then you know why split up the whole. Indeed, this often comes down to it, doesn't it? With banks, bigger might not be better or prettier, but uh, 
it's sort of how things have arrived at, at and uh, it can be very hard uh, to do structures that have averged, uh, emerged in like in HSBC's case over centuries. So I'm, I'm sure we'll uh, revisit the breakup question again in the coming months and years. So China is, of course, uh, a byword for massive state-backed infrastructure projects and getting things done, though, of course, the system of accountability and rules are somewhat different in a command economy led by a single party. Closer to home, the news has focused on the current difficulties or inability even of the UK government to deliver on its signature infrastructure project. Um, That subject, along with the question of how investors navigate the sector, is the starting point for this week's cover feature, whose author Mike Fay is here to discuss with me. Mike, I mean, I expect many listeners will have followed the news about HS2 probably as concerned or maybe despairing um, citizens. I mean, it all seems like a very fraught subject, uh, you know, regardless of investment right now. I mean, what was the impetus for this piece from an investor perspective? So fraught is absolutely the word. To kind of um, let some of the lighting on the magic at the IC here, (laughs) the features that we have sometimes are planned a long time in advance and um, HS2 sort of appeared as a massively more pressing issue in the midst of writing this. The idea was months ago from my sins, one of the things I do is cover the main contractors here, the likes of the Balfour Beatties and Kears and Costains of this world. And for the last couple of years, if you talk to them or you look at their pitch to investors, it's been around this solid infrastructure pipeline that we've got in the UK, this figure of 650 billion that the UK government is pumping in not only to HS2 and to other rail projects, but roads and nuclear plants and crossings and bridges and everything else. Um, It's quite, in one way, it's quite a compelling argument. You know, it's the biggest spend by government ever on infrastructure in one parliament. You know, the government's a safe client. Uh, These are multi-year programs, which then allow the contractors to take much more long-term decisions. You know, they can decide to buy plant and equipment rather than rent them. If they so wish, they can, they know they can train up so many thousands of apprentices. And the model for the way in which contractors deliver some of these has changed in recent years so that the contractors take on much less risk. So you look at it from an investor's perspective, and this seems like quite a sound thing. However, the reason why I decided to look at it is because even before HS2 cancelled, there were signs that this pipeline might not be as solid as it was made out, particularly at the end of last year when we had Liz Truss's government and the quasi quarting budget, which blew up immediately. Um, Jeremy Hunt's first autumn statement a year ago started slowly to rain back in on some of the promises they were talking about um the 650 billion commitment still being there but only in cash terms so any impact of inflation then has to, you know projects then either have to be delayed or remodeled or pushed back into the next parliament and given that at that time in building costs were running like well, pretty much 20 percent year on year That then means, and you've got higher wage costs as well, that then means that some of these programmes were obviously going to have to be uh, rescheduled or pushed back or there had to be savings found somewhere. And when you look at around it, some of the other big projects that were out there as well, the likes of the power stations at Hinkley Point C, which was already running years behind schedule um, and over budget and things like Sizewell C that haven't yet got out of the ground. I just thought it was would be useful to look from uh, the UK perspective as to why so many things run over and whether it's something that the UK is particularly bad at or whether this is a global phenomenon. So, uh, I mean, uh, so breaking it down, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, for the piece, you, you, you spoke to, you know, the guy who has literally written the book on how to get big projects done, um, which is obviously a good starting point. What what do investors need to understand about, uh, I suppose, large project work we're, we're talking about here and, and the secondary economy? I mean, is, is big infrastructure work better or is it just more complicated and likely to fail and therefore a red flag? Is it as simple as that? Or? 
Yeah, uh, so the guy who wrote the book is a professor at Oxford University called Bent ben Fleidberg. I apologise if I mangled your name there, Bent. Um, it, it's, his book is really interesting because um, not only did he write the book, he also came up with the, the way of measuring how these projects happen up until about a decade or so ago. Nobody measured how often mega projects, which are typically classed as those with a value of over a billion, how well they performed, how often they failed, when they failed, how badly they failed. Um, so he, he's now tracked about 16,000 mega projects in 130 countries. And the, the findings are quite shocking. It, it isn't just the UK that's bad, it everywhere is. And the scale of how bad uh, we are as a, as a species <laughs> of <laughs> of getting these things wrong is massive. Um, less than half of mega projects actually meet the original budget target. And there's only something like eight and a half percent that meet the budget target and deliver on time. And I think he said 0.5% deliver on time to budget with all of the original benefits of so schemes haven't been watered down just to meet budget and cost targets. There's loads of reasons for this. He talked about a lack of proper planning. And um, in the book, he talks about Pixar planning, which is the Pixar do really rough cuts of their stories and they go back and forth countless times and refine the story until they know they've actually got the story right because the really expensive bit is bringing in the Hollywood actors at the end to do the voiceovers and getting the animation, the CGI and the programming right and you can't really afford to be rewriting on the go. And it's the same with mega projects, you know, they say plan and plan and plan until you get to the stage where you know what you're doing and then have the shortest possible window for delivery because the longer you leave that window open, the more... Um, susceptible you are to things like a global pandemic or, or a war in Europe pushing up steel prices by 20%. And yeah. So so I suppose for investors, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily make it easier to, to, to navigate from, you know, really breaking it down to uh, from, from the invest, investor perspective. Mm. Did you get a sense in, in looking at uh, infrastructure, you know, as we are in 2023, that there is uh, a smarter position for for the the individual vest investor to be positioned vis-a-vis -vis whether it's in the listed contractors the asset owners of infrastructure or debt providers or, or what have you is there is, is there a vantage point looking in on that and, and given that there's a lot of infrastructure projects being planned in the uk and around the world that uh, that is is possibly better than the others yeah um so I think when you look at something, whether it's a, it depends on how you are looking at this and how you want to play it in terms of an investor. If you are somebody who is happy invested in funds and happy invested in themes, then clearly uh, a fund or an infrastructure trust might be the right way to go. If you take the the broad trend is going to be that infrastructure investment still needs to happen in whatever way it happens and however it is funded. If you're somebody who wants to pick a stock and you're looking at the contractors on the basis of infrastructure alone, it's probably, I don't know, I think it's probably not the right way to go about it because there are so many other factors that play into it. I mean, if I were looking at the stocks on a, on the basis purely of an infrastructure argument, I would maybe be uh, taming some of my expectations. But the the listed contractors, when you speak to them, say about HS2, none of the second phase was in the current order books. So it shouldn't really make a difference to the investment case. And also there were so many other factors. I mean, we've got, I think, three of the four major contractors on a buy. And some of that's just down to the past history and the valuation and the fact that valuations of, of the likes of Keir and Costain are so badly beaten down that um, that they seem like a decent value investment. Whether or not the you know the the infrastructure pipeline plays out exactly in the way that we expect. 
Well, you can read Mike's feature, How to Get Infrastructure Right, uh, in this week's magazine, either online or in print, and available, of course, from all good news agents. We recently had some feedback to this podcast from a listener asking for more coverage of smaller companies. And so I'm happy to say for our final segment, we can oblige with a company that wasn't so small not so long ago. And that company is ASOS. Gemma, you, you covered the uh, the fast fashion websites uh, for your numbers this week. Um, I was looking back as recently as March 2021, this was a, a nearly £5 billion company. It's now worth £400 million. Really, really big uh, descent. What's what's happened? Um, a variety of things, I think. So the most obvious thing is the macro environment. So people are obviously tightening their belts and ASOS customers, particularly ASOS's youngest customers, are spending much less than they used to. Um, There's also the fact that people are going into physical shops a lot more than they did during the pandemic, which is hurting the pure online players. So so that's the the very obvious story. And sales were down by about 10% in in the year they just reported. But I think the troubles stretch further back than that, because as you say, this company grew extremely quickly and it's been very, very obsessed with fast revenue growth. But between 2018 and 2022, its stock levels actually doubled, which meant it was holding like so many clothes, shoes, cosmetics, which it wasn't easily able to shift. Um, so then it was forced to sort of introduce loads of discounts, which then obviously hit the profitability. So it's been dealing with with this issue as well. And coming into the, the last financial year, it had over a billion pounds worth of stock that it urgently needed to shift. Um, and the new chief executive was quite frank about this, actually. And I suppose it's easier to be frank about a company you weren't managing when it was all going wrong. But he basically said the company was too slow and inefficient and held stock far too long, um, believing it had limitless shelf space. So now it's on this mission to turn itself around. But obviously, it's doing so against a very difficult macro backdrop. And it is not going smoothly, I think it's fair to say. So there was bad management. There's maybe been a bit of sort of bad timing and 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 hard luck with uh with consumer sentiment there's a you know a few things we can sort of unpack i mean one of the things you highlighted in the uh in the uh in your write-up was the, the the balance sheet and you know you've you've sort of messaged me when you, you saw the results that um you know there's, there's potentially a fear that they might soon be be buried in debt how much are we sort of talking what's um what's changed in their capital structure in, in the last uh in the last year and, and, and how fast might things move from here vis-a-vis sort of liquidity and, uh, and and leverage? So management made quite a big song and dance about the balance sheet and the results. So basically they refinanced the balance sheet and said there should be more stability because profit-based covenants have been removed. So basically it only has to worry about liquidity covenants. And that struck me as quite odd, given ASOS's current state, that somebody would want to, to lend without that safety net. So had a, a trawl through and you had to sort of get to the, I think it was Note 13, which is a little bit ominous in itself, but saying the new debt facilities bear an interest rate above the sterling overnight index average, which at the end of the year was 5.2%. So it's got a, a very hefty interest rate they're paying on that. And at the same time, their borrowings have gone up a lot. I think their net debt had about doubled. So they're dealing with this big pile of debt where they're having to pay very expensive finance costs. And at the same time, their free cash flow is extremely negative. There was more than £200 million worth of free cash outflow in the last year. So there is this worry that as pressure continues to mount, sales aren't expected to pick up, that cash is basically just going to keep flowing out of the business and they're going to have to pay more and more to, to service this new debt. Right, yeah. So, so it's a it's a, it's a tricky position, and I suppose you know, unless they've got particularly forgiving bankers who who just don't worry about things like profitability. Now, they they obviously want you know to keep the ASOS show in the road. They have a, they have an investment here in uh, the debt. That said, I mean, just sort of looking ahead, obviously they've got a kind of still relatively new broom in charge. Looking at the shares, I mean, over over their history, it's, it has been a story of boom bust, boom bust, boom bust. Is there is there any kind of uh, tangible turnaround that investors can sort of pin their uh, hats, coats and uh, other assorted ordered items on? It's hard because a business like this, you never have much visibility and you've always got this underlying fear that things might just suddenly go out of fashion and people will start buying things from elsewhere. So from what people are saying, I think the big thing will be if they can stimulate demand again. 
um, and get that top line growth going, which would obviously then generate cash to help it stay on top of things elsewhere. But management expects sales to fall again next year. And they sort of put out this fairly vague statement saying um, they think in the final quarter of next year, sales might start picking up again. But again, it feels a bit like guesswork at this point. You can't you can't really know, but there does seem to be this genuine push to make products more profitable, to get rid of these customers who are buying lots of things and then returning them, which is ultimately just ending up in loss-making activities um, and keeping stock at a more manageable level. So there are things they can improve, but they do seem very at the mercy of, of their customers, really, and how much money people have got to spend. Yeah, I mean, that does sound like a real distant uh the glimmer of hope for uh, for the business thinking things are going to improve in more than a year's time. ASOS results landed, uh, I think, on the same day uh, as as we had some uh, uh, an update from Next as well. Uh, I mean, within within fashion, it does seem like it is possible to navigate these these very brutal uh, swings in sentiment and you know branding and and trading and managing stock levels within fast fashion. Though, I mean, with ASOS, do you, you get the sense that this is, uh, you know, that this is a, a sector that investors can be bullish about at all? Or is it really at the brutal end of that of that sort of market segmentation? It's hard to know, because as you say, Next published its uh, an update on the same day as ASOS and it put through this uh, another profit upgrade. So everyone was feeling very cheerful about that. So it doesn't seem all retailers are, are struggling, but then... I suppose Next and ASOS don't have huge amounts in common. So Next obviously a very old company and its big problem is staying relevant and it's basically reached such a big size that it's now having to think about new ways to expand. And But ASOS was almost the opposite. It was very small and then grew extremely quickly and it didn't have the infrastructure to back that up. And often talking to analysts about Next, that's the thing they stress. That it's got this huge infrastructure behind it. It's extremely carefully managed, very efficient um, and I don't know, quite a close connection with its customers, it seems, which companies like ASOS and Boohoo seems to lack at the moment, I think. Interesting. It's almost like there's some ingredients of each company which the other wants, but uh, there's only one that uh, seems to be profiting from it reliably. I think that leaves us just about out of time for this week. So all that is left for me to do is to is thank Gemma, Mike and Julian uh, for your thoughts and to Maddie Apthorpe in the in the studio for producing this episode. Dan should be back in the big seat next week. So until then, thank you for listening and goodbye. Mm-hmm.